Once again, let's welcome our worthy hosts. Welcome everybody back to the tavern. I hope you guys have enjoyed the halfway point so far. We're a little bit into the elimination and the advancement stages. I'm Frodan, I'm joined by Brian Kibler, and we're about to introduce to you guys the next match, which is the first player that's gonna be sent home from the Bahamas. Yeah, I mean, of all places to get knocked out of a tournament, you don't want it to happen anywhere, but we just saw, you know, the sand, the beaches. You got some stuff you can keep yourself busy with the next few days. A nice consolation prize. It's X Hope from China up against B77 from Japan. Here's a take a look at their deck lists, and we do have the bands in. It seems like we won't have the old freeze me versus control warrior. It, it's, it's interesting. You know, B77, the only person to bring control warrior, and he, he might not even get a chance to play it all tournament if he drops here. And he was saying uh, that it's his favorite deck. He was inspired by Matson, uh, a fellow Japanese player who qualified for the Winter Championship last year, uh, and control warrior was his favorite deck, and uh, that kind of bled through to his, uh, his protege here. Maybe not too much to be concerned about, though, because B-77 said all he wanted to target was decks like Pirate Warrior. So we do know that's a possibility for him to sweep it. Or will Reno Priest be once again a weak spot here, Brian? It performed very poorly in the first series. Yeah, we really wasn't impressed by how the Reno Priest deck played out in the previous series. Not only did it, did it lose, but there were a lot of games where it just didn't even feel like it was in the game. He felt like he just kept drawing the wrong cards at the wrong time. But that's going to happen when you have so many situational cards in your deck. Yeah, triple Reno strategy, certainly bold, but we'll see what ends up happening. Let's go ahead and meet our players. Our first, hailing from China, please welcome to the stage, X Hope. And his opponents representing Japan and all Reno players out there, please give a warm welcome to B787. versus X-Hope. X-Hope, I honestly don't know him as a player that much. I actually thought I would win my match, so I only looked at Frozen's decks. So now I'll have to quickly go back and check B787's lineups. There's a lineup to beat with my decks. It's his lineup, so hopefully I win. I'm really confident in myself, and I hope things go my way. I hope I just calm down and play well. <laughs> B787 versus X Hope. Let's see what you got! B787 from Japan versus X Hope from China. This is a huge match for both of these players. The loser is eliminated from this tournament. Yeah, and finally, with the stakes at an all time high, we might see B787's uh, unique strategy coming to fruition. You saw in his, his own words there, he said, this is the lineup for my decks to come up against. I'm expecting possibly even to see him leaving the Pirate Warrior up when you're bringing as much Reno and as much heavy control as he is bringing to this tournament. Pirate Warrior is potentially a deck that you want to target. So I'm sure people at home have enjoyed the little refreshing change from Pirates <laughs> Running Wild, but we might see it once or twice during the series, but we will await the bans. Yeah, we'll definitely check that out. And I'm really looking forward to this. You know, I, I mean, we've spoke about all the players a lot over the past few days, but I am uh, very excited for B787 and to see his decks. You know, there's um, a lot of cool decks in there. There was just a very quick uh, early technical issue there. We're just going to restart the game and it should be fine. So we are going to be moving into the game very, very shortly. And I just, I can't wait to see this lineup. B787 is just got a very cool lineup. I'm interested about the priest list. You know, yep. it seems like it can, you know, have some very hard hitting combinations of cards but, you know, very small chance to draw those combos. But instead, it's going to be the Mage and the Rogue kicking off this series. Yeah, and X-Hope's uh, Miracle Rogue is a little bit unique in the fact that he has omitted the uh, patches package from his list entirely. He's using a bit of extra mid-game power in terms of barns to be able to pull out those questings, auctioneers, tomb pillagers even, picking up some value. And uh, Polymorph is a, a reasonable hard removal option there for a, a rogue deck that sometimes struggles to deal with large minions on the board if they don't have a sap available. Yeah, definitely going to be flexible later on, but at the moment, X-Hope has not drawn much uh, 
Much really to start with this pressure, to be honest. He can clear off this mistress, nothing too crazy. Gets the health back, of course, with the trade with the weapon, so nothing to worry about. But I feel like as the rogue here, you really want to start getting to those tomb pillagers very, very quickly. Yeah, tomb pillager against pretty much any control deck, which, hey, B787, his whole lineup is control <laughs> yep. deck. So in this entire series, tomb pillagers are going to be a crucial card for X Hope because they're just such a powerful mid game minion. They demand strong removal options from your opponent which then, even if the removal takes place, you still get the coin in return, and it siphons strong removal away from your Edwin, your Auctioneer, your Questing Adventurers, the real uh, killer threats in the deck. So that's why Tomb Pillage is such a crucial card to pick up when you're trying to build mid-game board development against these control decks. Yeah, and speaking of coins, we could have seen the Doomsayer that turn if X-Hope was on the coin, because there's a chance to coin out you know, Tomb right. Pillager and really start to ramp up the pressure. But because B7 knew that wasn't available, well, he can hold on to this Doomsayer and maybe even play this turn to deny the potential 4-drop. We can see, of course, that the only 4-mana uh, card in hand is a Polymorph and probably not worth doing on a Doomsayer empty board. Doesn't seem too strong, no, but this matchup quite often is decided by the power of your Kazaka's potion, so B7 having access to that early on is a very big deal. 4 damage AoE is massive just because of the amount of rogue minions that it lines up against so well, and polymorph effects are worth their weight in gold, because our soon-to-be dearly departed card Conceal hmm. is the absolute backbreaker in this matchup. Yeah, I'm okay with that card, taking, it, <laughs> taking a bit of a vacation for itself. Uh, just like we have for this. And it's definitely one of these scary cards to come up against in this rogue deck. And the Doomsayer does come down from B787 just to deny the potential of the four drop, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. But XO can just continue to take this slow. He's probably kind of okay that the Doomsayer is down now and there's not a lot to play for because it means it's just gone. He doesn't have to worry about it unless it comes from a resurrect from a Kazakh's potion. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the considerations. Anytime you play Doomsayer, you know, B7 was deep in the tank that turn, really thinking through his options. Coin four drop, either of the four drops in his hand was available to him. He chose to go with that Doomsayer. The reasoning behind that, as you said, blocking that four mana turn, which we've already explained is such a big deal for X Hope. And B7 was using it to just tempo and set up this Kazaka's potion it does get the four damage AOE effect, which is massive. Yeah, yeah, and this, this second choice, as well, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what B7 actually went for. Uh, and it was the deal like five deal damage. Five, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say because cards like Questing, uh, Big Van Cleef, you can really help the four damage from the AoE right. plus the five. You can pretty much just remove anything on the turn it's played, right? Yeah, it's also one of the big frustrations of playing against Kazakus because, you know, your opponent getting one particular effect off a five or ten mana is, you know, above 50%. So, you know, you can reasonably play around these eventualities. It's a serious thing that you can consider. When it comes down to a specific dual combination, yeah. obviously that percentage nearly half so you're coming down to the position where you never play around a specific two card combination so a big board with one big Edwin one big questing and then another wide board alongside it that's something that you'll generate and feel safe and that particular Kazaka's combination can be backbreaking against that yeah and X hope does finally draw into the tomb pillagers so you know this this might not be a gadget Zan turn he could go for gadget Zan conceal uh, sorry prep conceal see what happens does have a coin as well in hand but he's just going to go for the Tomb Pillager this turn, take it a little bit slower. And, you know, this is reasonable, but B7, A7 is actually, you know, fairly ahead. And look at all this AoE he has. Now he has the... Uh the Twilight Flamecaller as well. Yeah, Flamecaller, one of the unique tech choices in his deck. He is tilting his decks uh, with a control strategy and giving extra nods to defeating aggressive decks as well. And the 4-6 the body, uh, Streetwise Investigator, I believe, yep. is the name. 4-6, uh, great stat line to pick up off Firelands Portal. We saw the, uh, the white eyes in the previous series. It's not quite in that school of outcomes from Portal, but you will take a 4-6 every time. And most importantly, he looks pretty cool. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think he's a uh, really cool artwork Style on that card. Style over substance, as always, Raven. Yeah, I was going to say, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't yeah. it? Gadget Zen is going to come down this turn, though, and here the cycle begins. We've seen a lot of these style of turns already in this tournament with these big rogue plays, and we're going to see it right now with both preparations in hand and the coin. It's going to open up a lot of options for X Hope here. Yeah, and it's curious. You're kind of seeing the big difference between, uh, for example, Stanudachi's deck in the previous game and B7's in this series. Um, a, a fairly well-known, um, you know, 
exhibition match was played between uh, Fino and Rage in yep. this matchup because there was a lot of disagreement as to who won. The Reno Mage was very, very dominant, but it was a super cycle-heavy, burn-heavy deck that was getting the job done, similar to what Stan was playing. B7s, much slower, much more minion-based, much more value-based, much more anti-aggro, and that's the kind of Reno Mage deck that Rogue can exploit because they get so much more time to do disgusting things like this. I hope a spell was... Yeah, there we go. It's always a little bit scary on moments like that. You see the rope end, it's like, has he locked in all the turns? Uh, and he has, though. So Exhope is fine with this stealth. But there's a Kazakas potion that isn't going to be able to quite get rid of the quest nope. of Adventurer. The number five on that minion is very, very important as it cannot be targeted for the extra damage we talked about earlier on the potion to get rid of it either. Yeah, but wait just a minute here because, again, even though this isn't the burn heavy deck from B7, he is pushing serious amounts of damage here. That deal five on the Kazakas potion that we talked about being able to help kill an Edwin or a questing, that can hit face. That puts X Hope at effective nine. The Forgotten Torch in hand puts him at effective six. A couple of pings can go alongside that. He's just one more burn spell ping pick up away from ending this game. Yeah. Never forget about just going face, mm -hmm. because a lot of the times, that's when you win. And it looks like that's going to be the play. Five damage to face, does clear off the gadgets then. So Quest Adventure uh, is a threat, but being on 29 health, something crazy would have to happen to flip this game super hard this turn at least, Fex Hope. Yeah, Coldblood and Eviscerate are available here. He has Swashburglar to lead the, car the turn out. Double Coldblood, in fact. So with just those four cards being played, that's 5, 10, 15, 21 damage plus 22 from the dagger so we'd need additional sources of damage or uh, seven additional cards which seems unlikely to happen so if the swash picked up significant burn in that spot there could have actually still been a potential lethal this turn which is just silly it is <laughs> okay so we are going to see the cold bloods being used i am um, imagine x hope is going to clear off this 4-2 uh, sitting around on A health, you can't really trust anything to uh, go right if you leave this guy up. So unfortunately, he is going to go away as he's removed by the Eviscerate. Here comes Van Cleef though, and this is a huge mm. threatening board. Look at that quest adventure. Casual hit for 18, and a 10-10 on the board as well. Yep, unfortunately for X-Hope, Blizzard does not care too much about the size of the minions. It will buy him a turn here. Both Cold Bloods used alongside that Eviscerate. So even if there was the uh, Leroy in hand for X Hope, B7 would probably feel relatively comfortable surviving this turn. But he does have to think about setting himself up a win condition of his own. Blizzard ping face would push X Hope down to seven. Blood Mage, Forgotten Torch, ping the turn after is only five, so he is short right now. He needs to figure out how he's going to get through the rest of his deck and yeah. pick up another burn spell. I was actually thinking Blood Mage Blizzard, yeah, because it. It, well, it. one, if it stays alive, hey, spell damage is pretty good when right. you're trying to kill your opponent. If it gets removed, well, you draw in a card, which means you're drawing towards more burn to end this game very quickly. Rogue, not a class known for its healing at the moment, at least. Yeah, not so much, but X-Hope is just short of that damage right now. This questing is, is going to be an ever-growing threat, though, if he keeps loading up on minions. And B7 does look like he is on a draw to save this game. He does have some rebuys in his deck, like Ice Block, for example, can, can let, allow him to see another turn. And as you mentioned, the game plan against Rogue is very, very linear when it comes to setting up lethals for yourself. No taunts come down. No heals come down. The number you see is what you have to deal with. So the game plan is crystallized in perfect clarity for B787 this game. Exactly, and that game plan is not really dealing with these minions that are on the board at this point, as they are uh, kind of crazy, especially with the conceal draw means you can't directly interact with them anyway if X-Hope goes for it, um, as opposed to the uh, the Tomb Pillager. Do you think that could, e that could even be a polymorph? Yeah, I was going to say, just remove the additional card draw. I love it. You need one less out for your opponent, and that is actually huge when you're pretty much setting lethal up that turn. Yeah, I love it. That's a really, really heads up play from Exo, recognizing exactly what B7 is trying to set up here. Polymorph is a dead draw. Is there any way that he can use that to take enough damage off the board? I'm not seeing it. No, he can't, he, he can't polymorph and kill off the quest. Well, he can't polymorph and kill off whatever he doesn't polymorph, right? right? One of the big guys, Van Cleef, all the quest in, as the health is just a little bit too much. There's there's uh, the torch and the arcane blast, but it's not adding up to the right amount of damage. 
Yeah, Polymorph on one and Torch Ping would be his maximum removal afterwards, which would deal five, which isn't enough to answer either of the big threats, only enough to deal with the Drake. So B7 uh, valiantly tried to set himself up a win in a fashion that this deck really isn't built to do. If this was Shdanu Dachi's build in this particular matchup, even if he didn't hit the increased amount of burn he did have in his deck, there's Novice Engineers. There's additional cycle cards that can pull him through and help him get there faster. He would have naturally drawn more cards by this point in the game. As you can see, only 13 cards drawn that entire game from B787. And I, I respect the line that he took trying to set up that win condition, recognizing that he can't stay in the long game against X-Hope's Rogue, but just falling short at the last there. That polymorph on the Blood Mage, we'll never know, but that <laughs> could have been game-defining, series-defining, championship-defining for X-Hope. It really could. As we mentioned, this is an elimination match. The loser is out. The winner lives to fight another day at this point. I was just going to say as well, the difference, you know, that an ice block would have made buys you one more turn to potentially draw that damage and squeeze in a few more pings. If ice block was live, the actual previous turns may have looked differently because you know you have that additional turn. So kind of crazy. It looked like B7 was in such great control of that game, but then, you know, Rogue did its thing basically for X Hope and it uh, worked out in the end for him. Yep. And interesting there, now having seen the bans, that uh, B7 did ban out the Pirate Warrior in the end. So he's still not looking to go up against this deck, even with all the Reno, the Control Warrior, everything that he's packing. I really sit back and wonder what this Reno Priest is doing in his lineup. Like, what matchups he really thinks that's coming up against. We asked him this question personally, and he just said, hey, I wanted to bring a fifth Control deck. There aren't that many options. I only play control. I'd rather play control and lose than bring an aggro deck and win. Some of you guys might respect the hell out of him for that, but <laughs> it could end up being his downfall because I just don't see where this Reno Priest is picking up favorable matchups. Yeah, and while we were wondering about the decks, you may be wondering to you know a little bit more about these players so we can uh, check them out here with a couple of well mets. Well met. My name is X Hope, and I'm from China. My last name is X I N G, so I chose X, the first letter of my last name, as the first letter of my battle tag. And for the hope as the end of my battle tag, one day I was watching a stream of a Chinese tournament, and I thought I could play better than them, so I thought I should join Hearthstone as a pro gamer and I'll probably be the hope of Chinese Hearthstone. Uh, the best thing about playing in the Hearthstone Championship Tour is that this is my first time playing in a big tournament outside of China. The Bahamas is a really good place. It has great weather and a beautiful ocean. I'm really excited to be here. Well met. My name is B787, I'm from Japan, and I am 19 years old. I play Hearthstone about five, six hours a day. My favorite snack when playing is Kit Kats. Favorite food is steak, meat in general, yeah. <laughs> the best thing about playing in the HCT is the fact that I get to come to Bahamas. <laughs> Both players excited to be here, but now the tension's gonna be kicking in as this is the elimination match. B787 is down one game to X-Hope, taking the win last game with his Rogue. Yeah, just looking at those those media pieces, I, B7, I loved how every answer he gave still seemed to be in the form of a question. It's like, what's my favorite <laughs> snack? Uh, Kit Kats? <laughs> yeah, I think. I have a question for you, B7. Reno Priest? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I'm sure you'll answer after this match. What is your favorite snack? So. Hmm, excellent question. Do I have to answer in the form of a question in standard B7? Yeah, and then I'll tell you if it's allowed or not. No, I'll get back to you later. Oh, okay, yeah. great. So um, these players are just getting ready to go into their game, and I think the uh, the big question is the Reno Priest and how it's going to perform, as it didn't quite do the job in B787's previous match. We can just check out the groups and how they have formed up as well. So far, we can see Group A. And uh, yeah, you know, we saw Shdanu Dashi win earlier. Frozen is now knocked into the lower bracket and he will be facing the winner of this match that is being played out right now. So definitely plenty 
more exciting Hearthstone matches coming up today. Yep, Stanley actually already booked his spot in the knockout stage, one game away now from qualifying for the World Championship, and perhaps most importantly, he has a couple of days off from this point just to be able to chill on the beach, enjoy the sun, take in the beautiful Bahama setting that we are in. But these two guys still have it all to play for, and you can see that crystallized on B7's face far better than any words I could throw at you. That is what it all means right now. Yeah, 100%. Even for these players that we've seen, it's the kind of first outing into a major tournament. There is the approach where they're like, oh, you know, this is just fantastic opportunity. You know, it's great to come to a huge tournament like this and play. But when the stakes are, you know, this high, it becomes very, very serious. These players are playing to win and playing to qualify. As we move into game two now, B787 on his mage and X-Hope on his shaman. Yes, indeed. B7 going back into the tank with this Reno Mage. X-Hope with this uh, Jade-based build of Midrange Shaman. Most people now switching to the Midrange build. A couple of holdouts running the Hammer of Twilight aggro version, but still within the Midrange archetype. So many different ways you can put it together. Bloodlust, Alakir, Jade Package, sprinkling of Jades alongside the standard Thunder Bluff Midrange from, from back in the day. X-Hope, though, going with a very, very robust jade package and making room for all these jade cards by sacrificing aoe only one lightning storm only one maelstrom portal yeah and i think the important cards for exo here will be the uh, the bloodlust for a start yep. and then also getting a brand combo off with at least one of the jade cards because that's how you really accelerate uh, the jades in this matchup and in any matchup in general but if you go too slow against uh, the reno mage they're going to be able to piece together the tools to either freeze you out long enough to kill you or you know just actually just kill you before you can even build a board up that's threatening anyway this is a great start for X Hope, picking up double value from the Manatide Totem here. But yeah, I love the point about Bran. I think that's a huge deal in any control matchup. How you play Bran is actually kind of a high skill cap thing in these kind of matchups because you can choose to play Bran on a turn where you want to force your opponent to AoE. You play Bran, you make a big board with it, and you say, okay, sir, this turn you may AoE. I am fine with that. Alternatively, if you're doing fine generating a board otherwise, you can just hold on to Bran and Jade Claws and Jade Spirit in your yeah. hand, for example, force the board into a, uh, a manageable size, and then force your opponent to AoE that, use the Bran as your reload afterwards to crush them when the AoE options have gone. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of options to win this matchup. And, you know, B787's options aren't too fantastic here. It's actually prioritizing killing this Manatide Totem over getting the Refreshment Vendor down. Yeah, but dramatically different uh, different emotions being portrayed on B7's face in every single game. And this is a theme of what we saw from him in the APAC playoff as well. His stress levels seem to vary so wildly from one game to the other. One game, he just looked perfectly comfortable. He was, you know, mugging to the camera with his shades on. Other games, he was head in his hands, very emotive, very expressive. And you're seeing that now, not just from game to game, but from moment to moment. He looks dramatically different, really does wear his heart on his sleeve in terms of how his emotions are affecting him. Yeah, and I think this um, this play with the Doomsday actually gives a big nod to X-Hope as to what kind of hand B787 has. He doesn't have anything really that proactive. He's just got to try and hold out and wait and try and deny some of this early Jade buildup potentially. No great proactive options for X-Hope just yet in the early turns, but that downside has been offset by the upside that he got such a great Manatide Totem early on, picking up all these additional resources that are now filling his hand. Now he can start to explode onto the board over the next couple of turns, but that is a smart Doomsayer from B787. Uh, recognizing when you need to tempo Doomsayer is a key skill for any Doomsayer deck because some decks, if you just wait and wait and wait, go for the Frost Nova Doomsayer, Blizzard Doomsayer kind of thing for the full lockout. So many decks have tools to be able to deal with that, with hexes, mulches, all these kind of things you can come up against. So interesting little exchange. B7 tempos out the Doomsayer. X-Hope says, you know what? It is worth me sacrificing one card in my hand to make essentially every minion I play for the rest of the game plus one, plus one bigger. Yeah, and there's the brand. So that is available as and when required. There was an option to just hero power that turn. It's like, you know, the go-to option. Oh, Doomsayer, yep. okay, I'll just press hero power. Because it does, as we can see now, reduce the thing from below. Mm -hmm. So you're getting some kind of like half value from a bit of a rough Doomsayer turn. But X 
let's hope, yeah, just choose and say, okay, I have two Jade Lightnings. Worst case, I can use them to remove minions. Right. And if the Jades are, like you said, one bigger, mm -hmm. then I can, do, I can remove a minion and effectively play a minion. So then sort of swap that tempo very, very quickly. Yeah, I think the consideration for X-Hope that turn when he was planning out is the totem wouldn't have actually given him any more mana efficiency this turn. He was able to totem plus thing this turn anyway at the cost of three. If it was one cheaper and it was two, that only leaves one mana left available to him. That doesn't give him any extra board development options. So the idea was either, you know, reduce my thing from below or increase my Jade count. One of those didn't really matter in the situation if he was planning to play thing anyway. So he went with increasing the Jade count and I totally agree with that decision. Yeah, and it's only a matter of time until Jade Claws is drawn, and then Bran, as we discussed in the earlier series, so just, gets, just gets incredible. Oh, five mana, two, four, that effectively has Taunt, a weapon, and two Jades onto the board. Absolutely insane. B787 does have the Frost Nova, though, and Frost Nova timing in this matchup is key. Mm -hmm. You need The second you either do it too early or wait too long, you lose. Yep. You need to buy the perfect turn and then to set up the damage to finish the game. or Otherwise, it just doesn't matter when you Frost Nova at that point. Yeah, the longer you wait, the more damage your Frost Nova prevents, essentially. As especially against such a linear scaling deck as Jade Druid. Yeah, the deck, the, the board just naturally gets bigger as the game proceeds. As you said, wait one turn too long, Bloodlust. Boom. And that is the end of the game on the spot. I'd love it if that was the blood no uh, Bloodlust noise. Boom. <laughs> it's just like, all the extra damage. Finished. Okay, so thing for below. It's on one health. The Water Elemental also on one health. It's the Battle of the One Health minions. It is. Uh, Jade Lightning Flame Tongue is something that immediately leaps out at me here. Or Jade Lightning Maelstrom Portal actually looks even more promising. That sets up the Flame Tongue for you to be even stronger on the following turn. And it uses a bad card from your hand in the Maelstrom Portal, not famously particularly strong in this matchup, while preserving a good one in the Flame Tongue turn. But he does actually choose to go with the Flame Tongue line. That's very, very surprising to me. Yes, especially just because the spell damage totem is just great. Yep. It's just a great card. Second as we Jade said, Lightning it, it, in his hand, Storm in his hand. Yeah, it allowed him to get the really clean Jade Lightning there. And that's, mm -hmm. the kind of, that's one of the powers of Shaman in general, is that just that spell damage totem is absolutely huge in a lot of circumstances. This does develop the Flame Tongue, but it, in a deck where you're expecting to fill the board, you can get like tons of value from Flame Tongue later on. Yeah, and also how much value is this Flame Tongue really? Because this entire left side right now is exposed to just a ping. That would isolate the left-hand side of the Flame Tongue totem and reduce some of its value, even if he couldn't deal with it. It also opens up very, very effective turns like Forgotten Torch ping or Frostbolt ping, which takes so much of the power off the board. I feel like I would have liked to see the Maelstrom in that position. I think the plan for Exo might be, obviously depending on what P7 plays, he can just go straight into Jade Chieftain on the left, which then summons two minions to the left sure. of the flame tongue, and the first minion to, uh, on it is taunt. Yep. So then, you know, the taunt normally has to be traded up first, and you can get double buffs that way. So I guess there is a plan if you imagine your opponent to just ping and then you know move on with a, you know, a sort of lesser impactful turn. Yeah, but there is the Frostbolt ping turn that I was talking about, leaving just that 2-2 on the board, turning down the option to uh, Forbidden Flame that thing down, because Forbidden Flame is capable of taking out a much more high-priority minion later in the game. If there's a huge Jade in play that he needs to deal with, Forbidden Flame outside of Polymorph is one of his only effective ways to do that. Polymorph has now been picked up. Yeah, and one of the key cards in any uh, when you're playing Jades against a Reno deck, more common than not, is the Dirty Rat as well. If that's combined with Bran, or just you just get a Dirty Rat onto the second Jade Chieftain, for example, mm -hmm. then you, you actually losing the ability to proc that one additional Jade can actually be a huge deal, especially in Shaman, because in Druid you can kind of go infinite if you use the Jade Idols. So it's not the end of the world. In Jamin, you can't. Like, you, you pretty much have a set amount of Jade you can summon outside Bran living forever. You, you know what I mean? That, and even that that's set still amount set. is quite high, though. They, you is. can still make some big old Jades when you get there. But yeah, well, the, the whole idea is getting there, though, right? Because yep. if you only have one Jade guy in your hand at that time mm -hmm. and it gets pulled, sure. then you have to wait to draw the next right. Jade minion, yep. then you've got to play it and then build it up that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even just pulling out one can be impactful. But speaking of Jade minions, Aya's a pretty good one. 
Aya is pretty solid, yeah. It looks like X-Hope now is going to rely on that Maelstrom Portal just to pick up a favorable Oof. trade. That is the absolute nuts off of Portal. The 2-4 Injured Valdir entering play without activating its, da its self-damaging battle cry. 2-4 off a 2-damage Consecration is essentially what just happened that turn. Pretty good card. I would play yeah. that card. Also, there was the uh, Healing Stream Tome as well, just to back up in case the Injured Valdir felt like damage in itself. It would mm. be like, oh, the Tome's got you covered. It's fine. But yeah, this is absolutely huge. Flame Strike coming down now. Gonna help it's clear off. Enough. Yeah, gonna help clear off most of the board, but not all of the board. And look at this follow up. Bran into Aya is live. And X Hope. Doesn't look like he has to think about that that long. Right. And here's the problem with this uh, this anti-aggro or value-based version of Reno deck, uh, or however you want to refer to it. When you come up against decks like this, the inevitability is so far on the side of your opponent that you can really struggle to set up a win condition. V7 is going to try his level best right now with Antonidas Frost Nova. Can cash in Forbidden Flame here for another Fireball, Ooh. but chooses not to. Hmm. But this, very likely to get shut down from V7's perspective by a Hex from X-Hope. We, of course, see it's there. Just to finish my earlier point, he doesn't have that burn win condition that Seishidano Dachi does with his cycle burn uh, Reno Mage. So when you come up against a Jade deck like this, you just have to get so creative in terms of finding yourself a win condition because the inevitability of the Jades just marching on and on is always there from your Jade Shaman opponent. Yeah, and you see Antonidas into Nova on a board and there's plenty of cards in B787's hand. And when you still wonder how he's going to win the game, right. that's when you know he's, he's in a rough spot at this point. And there's still Jade Lightning available as well. We did, of course, see the Hex onto the Antonidas. Very clean. You don't really want to roll the dice with the Devolve on a 7-drop uh, minion. You might want to just take the safer route with Hex. Go um, ahead and drop that Trog as well. Already has seen the Flame Strike come out and saw the Frost Nova on the previous turn. So AoE options are starting to run sparse now for B7. Blizzard is available from X Hope's side. That would be the one uh, consideration that he was making. We see with our cast division, Blizzard is available and can lock out this board, but the brand is still a threat that needs dealing with. Yeah, and one of the problems is if Blizzard comes down, great, there's one turn. But, but what do you do after that, right? Yep. Like, look at the hand. The hand is, you know, weapon removal, Reno. And, you know, yeah, Reno goes up to 30. It doesn't matter when your Jade start hitting for 7, 8, 9 mm -hmm. uh, a bit later on into the game as well. And here's a kind of crazy position. Here's something we talked about in X Hope's previous series quite extensively as well. B7 every single turn now is going to be considering the threat of Bloodlust. We see it's not in hand from X-Hope. B7 knows it is in the deck. And I talked about kind of the mentality you need to be in, which is, can I beat Bloodlust not just this turn, but the next turn and the turn after as well? If the answer to that is no, you do often just have to shut your eyes and hope it's in the last two or three cards of your opponent's deck, and they just don't get there. Hey, Sol. Hey. Brand's still alive, and there's Jade Spirit. Agree. That is a, a factual observation. Value. I think we just jam it. Six, six, going and on. seven, seven. I think if I've kept count, yeah, yeah. six, six yeah, is on the yeah. card. So, thirteen, thirteen worth of stats just from the Jades. An extra two, three from the minion, and this board is getting ridiculously out of control. Yeah, right get, now. getting the Brand off once, as we mentioned, is, is good, right? You know, that's the aim. Getting it off twice is ridiculous. I, there's not been any Jade Claws yet, right? Nope. So there's two more Jades on top of this, and there's still a, uh, a Chieftain as well, at least from what I recall, still in the deck. So it's kind of crazy. Mm. Exo pretty much just has inevitability here, and B787 is going to have to try and piece together some way to kill Exo before this happens. And if we rewind to the Antonidas turn and the Forbidden Flame, mm -hmm. it would have been zero mana, mm -hmm. so it would have done zero damage. Mm -hmm but put a fireball in your hand. Yep. Suddenly, Alex Straza, natural fire, uh, sorry, Antonidas fireball, plus another Antonidas fireball, you can at least piece together some kind of damage and a, a rough semblance of a plan. Because I generally don't know what B787 is even thinking at this point. Yeah, I mean, the question, if you're if you're living in that world, the question is when you find the free turn to develop your ice block to be able to get the free turn to be able to do that, because he's had to utilize all of his mana on each turn just to answer the board yeah. to prevent lethal every single turn. So it would have been extremely difficult to try and make that kind of answer happen. And hey, we talked about J Claws, we talked about Bran. The hey. happy couple are back together yet again. Hey, Sol. Hey. Bran's still on the board. Correct. <laughs> oh, my lord. 
Interestingly, I mean, he, Exo was just thinking like, well, what do I even play now? The board's getting pretty full with these yeah. guys. Like, where do I squeeze this in? Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, I was just if, say, oh, yeah, wait, yeah. If, if the board is full <laughs> and you know Exo plays the Jade Claws, the Jade count still increases right. even though the minion does not appear on the board. So even if there's no trades you could do to lose the minions, you still do get the plus one counter on the Jade. Yeah, that shouldn't happen right now because you know he, he if he wants to uh, develop a board, he does have that Reno to trade smaller minions out to make room for the uh, the Jade Lightning and the Jade Claws if he wants to go that way, but he is just going to go right ahead and find the lethal here. Took his time to count Jade Claws and Jade Lightning, punishing for exactly 30. He actually attacked preemptively with the Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Uh... Could have uh, devolved his way through that uh, that taunt if he wanted to. Could, but could have overkilled for one. X-Hope is going to go out to a 2-0 lead, and uh, B7's lineup yet again is looking like it might be letting him down. Reno Mage, very popular archetype, but my question is about the particular build that he's put together, how appropriate that was for the tournament meta that he's been facing. All these anti-aggro tech inclusions, like uh, Twilight Flamecaller, for example, in a series where he's banning Pirate Warrior. It, it feels like you can find yourself a bigger win condition against other control decks than what B7 has. Oh, OK. I swear to you. I swear to you. <laughs> for those the last you didn't time, see, I just pointed to the bans for Sol's benefit. I swear, <laughs> the last time that graphic was shown, there was a Pirate Warrior ban. Don't, I was try, don't try and dig yourself out of this I one, I was Sol. confused as well, but I'm just going with what I was told. But yeah, that suddenly makes a lot more sense. I take back a ton of the criticism that I've been throwing at B7. That strategy makes a lot more sense if you're leaving Pirate Warrior up, of course, Twilight Flamecaller a perfectly good card. Yeah, and it is a bit of a more risky strategy in best of seven, mm -hmm. but a general conquest strategy is to say, okay, this one deck of yours will not get a win. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you just say, well, I might get some wins against the other ones, but if I'm unfavored, okay, I'll take the losses and then just get win after win after win. And I think that's what B787 has to do when he eventually hits this Pirate Warrior, if that's the case. Yep, absolutely. And now X-Hope is going to be queuing up his Freeze Mage up against the Reno Mage, which uh, most people would tend to say is a very, very difficult matchup for the Freeze Mage, but it is in fact winnable if you get through the, the right path in the game. Reno decks, you know, since their inception, early on people thought Reno Lock was favored against Freeze Mage. That was put to the sword very, very quickly as people figured out the correct route through the game. Reno Mage has all the tools to get through this, don't get me wrong. Ice Block is there, Reno is there, Dirty Rat is there to pull out a big threat from the opponent. But if the uh, Reno Mage, if the Freeze Mage, sorry, lines up all his card draw and up nicely, is able to pressure the first block without committing significant resources, and builds up a big, big damage combo with the Forgotten Co uh, Evolved Cobalt and Forgotten Torches, Roaring Torches, cheap burn in hand, together discounted by Emperor, it can definitely get the job done. Yeah, the Forgotten Cobalt, the name you use when you forgot the Cobalt's name. Correct. Yeah, Forgotten Cobalt <laughs> and Evolved Torch are the names of those cards, right? Yep, 100% correct. Uh, the two ice blocks in X Hope's hand, he probably wishes with any other two cards in the deck at this point because he knows what this Reno Mage is from B787. He's not expecting too much, like, really early pressure. So, you know, have, having one, he, oh, okay, I can just activate ice block. Having the second one's just like, ah, I wish that was card draw. Yep. Blood Mage Blast, efficient answer to the Acolyte there, getting a, a nice nice turn from B7, but X-Hope now, with that Blood Mage gone already, his hand has immediately run dry of card draw. This is not the kind of hand you want to be looking at in this situation. Yeah, and, you know, as we can see in this series, B7 is 0-2 down in this elimination match. And the mindset that comes into this situation is different for every single player. But we can hear from B7-8-7 on what he thinks when he falls behind in a series. Falling behind doesn't mean I've lost, so just try to calm down and sort of just keep playing the best that I can during the tournament. It's definitely a big ask when you're feeling the pressure of this elimination match. And, you know, B787 is going to have to you know, really, as he said, just calm down and focus to try and get this one. And he's still got a hill to climb if he wins this game. He does, um, but with the correct information now available to him, he's he's still in a reasonable spot because, you know, his lineup, his super heavy control lineup with all the Reno, all the Control Warrior stuff available to him, does have a chance of just clean sweeping Pirate Warrior. It's an extremely risky strategy, and I feel like I've been casting tournaments now for, for two years saying that when you come into a, uh, a tournament trying to counter the best deck in the meta,
the reason that deck is the best deck in the meta is that it cannot be countered consistently by a full lineup with a high percentage. And I think that is very much the case for Pirate Warrior. But if any lineup can do it, it is B7s. And we heard that in his, wor his own words earlier. He feels like X-Hope's lineup is the lineup he is looking to come up against. Yeah, when we see X-Hope drop the Emperor on six, and it you know, doesn't happen too often this, but he's actually hit a hell of a lot of burn damage with that Emperor already, which probably you know helped with the play that turn. Novice Engineer obviously probably would have preferred to get the card draw from that before the Emperor, but still hitting the Ice Lance and Double Frostbolt and the Torch, that's so cheap to fit in with that Forgotten Kobold, as you like to call it, Sol. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> if, he was, if he was to draw Kobold here, the, the majority of his hand can be played alongside it. Uh, if he cycles the Forgotten Torch away before then, which I would expect him to do, he has enough mana to fit in exactly a Fireball or a Roaring Torch on top of Frostbolt, Frostbolt, and Ice Lance. The, the two Frostbolts and Ice Lance, 14, uh, 10 damage natively, plus another six, that's 16. And there would be eight from a Fireball on top of the Evolved Kobold as well, making 24 damage in total. That is the kind of huge burst that I was talking about, but he hasn't quite got there in terms of phase one yet, which is try and pressure the, the pressure the Reno, pressure the first Ice Block if it was in play without committing huge resources. Yeah, well, one of the tricks as well is just like, just, just, just you know, poke them down to 24-ish right. yeah, and then exactly. just hold and hold and then burst them because it can happen when there's opening hands like this and you get the Emperor off. There's so much burn available, but still needs a bit more mana and still needs to find the Evolve Cobbled. Yeah, Novice Engineer being played out here. I think X-Hope would have liked to find a way to deal with this Emperor, but honestly, fireballing it is actually perfectly reasonable in this spot. More and more as time has gone on, we see fireball being used as removal in Freeze Mage games, primarily because it, it at four mana, it seems like a fairly cheap burn spell, an efficient burn spell, but it's actually quite difficult to combine with Evolve Cobalt. So normally the Roaring Torch is more effective, the Frostbolts and Ice Lances are more effective with those big burn combos. So fireball is actually fairly free, much like Forgotten Torch, to be used as a removal tool to buy you time. And in this case, actually build a board presence for Freeze Mage, which is not something you see every day. No, and the Emperor getting double ticks off starts to do silly, silly things. Zero mana Frostbolt, zero mana Ice Lance, the second Frostbolt, one mana Torch. That's kind of crazy. And still the card draw as well from the Loot Hoarder yep. is going to help out massively as X-Hope tries to uh, you know, play the Solitaire game and just pull all these pieces of the puzzle together to hopefully for him finish this game up very quickly. Yeah. Brand Babbling Book here looking pretty frantically for a way to deal with this Emperor Thorasan, which is just not available to him right now. Are we going to see a Dirty Rat follow-up to this? Is B7 now feeling desperate enough to just try and hit a big threat from the Dirty Rat? No such thing. Just Blizzard to lock out damage. That is just more burn potentially getting discounted. Acolyte is Cycle, bringing more cards in his hand now to get discounted. If he can hit an Alex Straza, an Evolved Kobold, if he can cycle these Forgotten Torches into his deck and then draw a Roaring Torch off this Acolyte, all of those things can be huge assets to get discounted. Yeah, I mean, Blood that Rage Thanos, not, not an Evolved Kobold, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. and, and this is kind of crazy because X-Hope's kind of getting to the stage where he can ignore what b 787 is doing to a certain extent. He probably just doesn't really care too much. Even with a brand down, obviously you like to kill it off if you can, but there's so much damage in his hand. He could just kill him from 25 very soon. I think it's time to uh, start trading some of these Forgotten Torches for yep. Reno, potentially, if it's in the hand. Just fire it at the face. He doesn't have a very efficient way unless he wants to commit the Blood Mage to the board now to take care of the brand. So he can put serious fear in the mind of B7 by just launching one burn spell at base here test the waters for that reno if it comes down fine we reset we go from scratch again if it doesn't suddenly we're in lethal town and especially when the burn spell you you have to use to do that is one that puts a three mana fireball in right. your deck as well you're pretty okay there's still alex straza available so if the reno does come down early then you know there's the option to just drop them all the way back down to 15 again Okay, so here's the reasoning behind what X-Hope did in the end. Firstly, the brand's a huge threat because Kazakas can come down, pick up double armor gain potentially, and then once there's double armor on top of all of that madness, it's hard to uh, push through that. But before I finish this thought, B7 <laughs> is going to go for the Dirty Rat turn. Oh, Get the yeah. sad news <laughs> that the hand from his opponent is 100% 
burn or utility spells in this spot. And that will put the fear of God into B787 at this point. He's going to be really, really precious about his life total. And it looks like he's missed the Emperor. Oh, oh. Wow. That so, are, are some of these cards like minus one mana effectively at this point? Oh my god. And it, it looked hilarious as well because it looks like the Dirty Rat was played as to try and stop the minion pressure from the Freeze Mage, which is just funny in itself. And there is just so much damage available for X Hope now. Think about all the things that had to go wrong for B7 <laughs> that turn for this Emperor to be alive. Dirty Rat came down. If it pulled a Doomsayer, the Emperor is dead. And then the Arcane Missiles, greater Arcane Missiles coming out afterwards, all three missing the Emperor. On top of the fact that that Emperor has just been sat there the whole game, he hasn't drawn a Fireball, he hasn't drawn a Polymorph, he's drawn no way to deal with this. Forbidden Flame would have done the job. B7 rightly looking absolutely devastated by the way this game is going right now. Those Arcane Missiles did not look so great to me. I think they need a, a rename for that card going forward. And yeah, B787's just kind of like, uh, okay, let's see what happens. And this Emperor just getting the work done. Even the Emperor hitting, what, twice? Yeah. It's just 10 damage that yeah. shouldn't exist. And as, <laughs> I, as I mentioned, both Fireballs now have been used as removal tools, but they have fine. they protected this Emperor and allowed the Emperor to connect face on both occasions, which has rebought 10 of the missed 12 damage of the Fireballs straight away. Finally, B7 gets to say goodbye to that Emperor, but so much damage has been done already. B7 plays a secret. Hopefully, X-Hope is keeping track and knows that that is is a babbling book secret. So his concerns, sure, it could be Ice Block, but he also has to think about Counterspell, Spellbender, and all the other potential options that have no impact on his game plan. Spellbender, of course, doesn't proc if you point a spell at face. So that is something that X-Hope can what beat in do? most situations. Yeah, and especially with this Roaring Torch draw, mm -hmm. that is actually just the damage he needs to win this game. If he commits. But, but what yet? Yeah, what is he going to do? This is at the point where, you know, a lot of everyone talks about just, just what is the best play, right? You tell me, so what is the best play if you are Exop here? The, okay, yes. Lead with Doomsayer. That checks for Mirror Entity. You have enough mana available to you to play the Frost Nova, <laughs> which checks for Counterspell. Spellbender is irrelevant. So now we are in the situation where Exop yeah, has it. tested every single secret he can, and he is just going to commit Great recognition from X-Hope. The hand tracking was on point here. You can see by his actions that turn, he knew he was playing around a babbling book secret, not a live ice block from the deck. X-Hope commits to the line, tests everything he can first. Masterful play from the Chinese player. And B7 is on the verge of going home. The shrug, I think, betrays everything here for B7. Yeah, X-Hope goes 3-0 up versus B787 in a great game. He navigated that perfectly and that is what makes these players so great he even pinged before the frost bolt just in case it was an ice block yep. to put him as low as possible it was just like okay you're covering all bases at this point yeah and this is just about keeping your play on point you know let's let's make no bones about it x hope was fortunate that game his emperor sticking for as long as he did was a very unrealistic scenario you will not see that happen too often giving average luck for both players the fact of the matter is when it came down to it at the end that was a very high skill play from x hope to be able to finish that game out to have the the fortitude to commit to that play and then the technical skill to sequence everything perfectly to play around every possibility. Yeah, absolutely great play. And I'm about to utter words that I didn't think I would say, at least for a long time, is we've got a treat for you, audience. We're going to see Pirate Warrior. Oh, baby. This is coming down to the wire. This might look like 3-0. It might look like B7 is dead and buried. It is 3-0, but B7 is not dead and buried. His super control heavy lineup and his decision to leave Pirate Warrior up, the first player that we have seen with this strategy all day, all tournament long, he is betting his world championship qualification on leaving the best deck in the format alive and kicking. X-Hope now has four chances to punish him for that. That's four too many chances for a Pirate Warrior as far as I'm concerned. This would scare me to no end if I was B787, but he is confident in his deck choices. This is the style he likes to play. 
So we're going to see if it pays off for him right now. Exo, not the craziest opening hand. He's going to keep the South Sea Captain, Ooh. which is a huge power-up card. And now he has Nazos first, mate. Fire War Axe, South Sea Captain. He does have a, a semblance of a curve. B787, you can already see, though, the way he thinks these decks will beat Pirate Warrior. There's Voidwalker on the board. He is running Pirate slash Patches, as you can see in hand. Not where he wants it, but still he can use it to respond to uh, any of the one-drop openings here. Yeah, this is super low-curve Reno from B787. Fiery War Axe can come down and take care of this 1-3, but B7 has so many early game tools in his deck to be able to counteract aggressive strategies. He has the Blood Sail Corsair Weapon Destruction alongside the patches, which he has unfortunately drawn. He has the extra one-drops with Voidwalker, Mistress of Mixtures in there as well, cutting out the clunky cards like Mountain Giant that you will never get to play against an aggro deck. Deck. This is as finely tuned a Reno Warlock as you can get in terms of defeating Pirate Warrior. Yeah, and this this opening hand and the Voidwalker has led to a potentially f funny course of turns in Coin Fire War Axe Swing, mm -hmm. and then Swing next turn into Double Nazoth First Mate, which right. just looks silly, yep. but it actually just might be the play because your follow-up can be South Sea Captain, which makes the First Mate's two twos and suddenly makes quite a scary board for B787 to deal with. Yeah, definitely the play from where I stand. The life tap is going to come down. We'll see if X-Hope is going to pick up a two-mana minion here or whether he just has to slam face just in order to get some board development this turn. I mean, sure, the War Axe to face, it's doing the job in terms of counting to 30 as quickly as you can, which is all Pirate Warrior is interested in a lot of the time. But it is a little bit wasteful. But the upside that you get from the three 1-1s that you're summoning on board, patches included, when you're curving into South Sea Captain the next turn, I think you just have to jam this guy yep. face and play your 1-1s. Yeah, especially because uh, that course of turns builds a board and then you follow up with the frothing that was just drawn, which means you have multiple trades into, for example, a taunt or a doomsayer that comes down to help buff the frothing going forward. So I like this. I think anything else would just feel too slow. Agreed, yeah. Um, and, and this is just the, the way you've got to play a lot of the time. You put as much on the board as possible, Ooh. not going for the second first So mate. that mm. indicates to me that he is, wants to go frothing next turn and not the captain, potentially. Uh, he's potentially also considering the threat of a uh, mind control tech coming up against him, uh, which actually, no, he's not. That's not a card that is featured in B7's list. So he's not even preemptively planning around having four minions on the board. He is just thinking about that frothing turn follow-up. Yeah, and another I kind of a nod to Pirate Warrior. If they've ever got a wide board, you probably lost anyway at that point. And Pirate Warrior can deal plenty of damage with just one to two minions with the size of the weapons they can get as well. So Doomsayer is going to come down, though, and it is going to go off with the help of Patches trading to some of the minions there. Yeah, it may have also just been a nod to uh, the threat of Demon Wrath on curve there, not wanting to put the additional card into it. But I don't think that's too huge of a deal in that spot. But now X-Hope has a little bit of a dilemma here. He can get himself a decent board presence with that Nazoth's first mate that he did hold on to alongside the Blood Cell Cultist and get a, a pretty solid 2-4 weapon alongside that, or he can follow through the plan it looked like he was going with, which is getting that frothing down as early as possible. And frothing is one of the huge cards when you come up against these resilient decks that B7's entire lineup is made up of, because it's the one card that if it sticks, it's infinite damage. Pirate Warrior just essentially has a limited amount of tools in their deck for dealing damage. When they stick minions like South Sea Captain, like Frothing Berserker, that's when your damage grows exponentially. Yeah, and I, I personally, I think the uh, Nazos first mate into Cultist is really nice here because you kind of just fish for a Shadow Bolt, right? You know, just in case. Sure. Because that yeah. Shadow Bolt just will be used. You know, you can't just be like, well, what if he plays Frothing next turn? Well, this 3-4 just lives and punches you in the face then. So I do like that ordering. And then you have two minions on the board for them to play Frothing and start trading away. And it looks like X-Hope agrees. Uh, I, I do love this play. I think this is the uh, correct way to go about it. Yeah, the, not the end of the decisions there, because he, he was wondering whether to get the uh, the full value out of the weapon, or you know he could have swung for one first to get one more damage in, essentially, or whether to just push two right now and potentially set up a faster lethal. And with the Leroy in hand, it might be the case that, that just that one extra damage this turn can increase his clock by one turn by pushing it. So definitely a consideration, just small factors of one single point of damage can make all the difference. Yeah, and we see the order of priority here as well for B787. He's dropped Kazakus, which means he can't play the ooze he has just drawn. 
uh, because, you know, he's just seen the weapon get buffed, but the weapon's only a two attack. So I'll just wait a turn. I'll play his next turn if I really want to. So he's just going to wait at that out a little bit and uh, whip it into a turn a little bit later on if he can. And now with the corruption on the 3-4, that's only going to get one attack off. Probably going to be the trade. So now there is a Kazakas potion in hand. So Frothing Berserker on the face of it looks really appealing here just because of the size you can build it to while taking care of this Kazakas. But he does have to consider the options of that potential deal four damage from the four damage AOE from the potion which we just saw is available. The other question for X-Hope is can he just go face here and set up a realistic two turn lethal that would demand B7 to have that perfect potion we talked about you don't play around the combination of four damage AOE plus the life gain. Okay, so he is going to go for the frothing play. I'm going to set that up and ask B787 the question, can you kill this frothing? If not, you are in some very, very serious trouble. So he could have pushed the three extra damage to face there, which would have set his opponent to 12. He's then representing just eight on the follow-up turn. So he didn't have a two-turn lethal set up, which kind of mandates that he does play for the board, which is what he tries to do. The, uh, the round 50% of the four damage AOE was there for B787, but X-Hope now has all the damage to spare. And even with that additional arcane intellect, if you like, from the Kazakas potion, still has not picked up that game-winning Reno Jackson. Yeah, this is going to be very, very close as B787 pretty much has like one turn to draw Reno or some kind of, you know, additional answer, but I don't quite know what that is in the deck. Maybe a taunt, uh, because this setup with these pirates is pretty huge. There's an Arcanite Reaper in the hand. There's a Leroy Jenkins in the hand. That is a lot of damage. There's a Dirty Rat in the hand now for B7. Is this a viable setup? If he plays the Rat here and pulls uh, an important minion like a Leroy, like a Corcron, does have the Shadow Bolt available, but the Shadow Bolt is, kind of feels like it's reserved for some of the board state right now. That South Sea Captain is a huge deal as well to take care of. Yeah, I th it's probably frustrating actually, because one of the benefits here is you can Shadow Bolt and ooze, right? So you remove the weapon, but the problem is because Exope has the mage hero power, yeah. the 5-4 plus ping still goes into the rat, right. which leaves an attack open for the uh, South Sea Captain, which is must be very frustrating for B7 here. Yeah, but it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't in this situation. If you Shadow Bolt the Captain to reduce that the power of that trade from the 5-4, from the, the Leroy is just still sticking yeah, around. Like, yeah, That's okay. a perfect <laughs> trade into your dirty rat either way. So. B7 would have hoped, you know, best case scenario, there were no minions or potentially just a small minion coming out in hand. And yep, Leroy is going to be taken down. As you said, the mage hero power is going to help a much more efficient trade go through here. Reaper and Corcron represents comfortable lethal over the next two turns. This could come down as many a game of Hearthstone has done in the past uh, several months to whether or not B7 can pick up a Reno here. And I'm glad, personally, that card's rotating out. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about you, but me as a caster, I've run out of ways to say, oh, he drew Reno quite a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, couldn't agree more on that one. And the Arcanite Reaper is going to be played first because it means you get, you unlock both swings, especially after seeing the use. Uh, you unlock both swings over two turns, and then the Corcoran is the plan to follow up for XOP here. B787, what is this draw gonna be? This is it's pretty much tournament life is on this draw, and it's Reno Jackson! That's all I've got! <laughs> Raven, he drew Reno. That, I've never heard it put like that before, so <laughs> Reno Jackson going all the way up to 30, and suddenly XOP is now kind of on the back foot, still has a lot of damage available. But Benefit of Reno as well, other than the going back up to full health, is the minion itself can trade very, very well. We might even see the Arcanite Reaper and the ping into Reno to guard the minions yeah, on board to. for repeat damage. To. Yeah, and, and he has a Fire War X as well to, to back up anyway, so... I, I mean, think with, with so much damage used already, Leroy has been used, the Reaper is equipped, that's another huge source of damage as well. A Corcron is on the board as well. These are draws that you are not getting from the remainder of your deck. So just trying to go face again from this position and hoping you get there with top decks doesn't seem like a likely plan. You need this 3-3 three, three, and 4-3 to stick around for another turn at least and connect again to make up in your lost damage. Yeah, and if we start to just piece together the damage available for X-Hope and how quickly that's going to come, next turn B7 can just twist in uh, to clear, clear the board if minions continue to flood. 
It's true. I mean, and then he has Draxus. Going face actually plays around Twisting Nether. That's an argument for actually just jamming it in the face. If you put your opponent on that being the only big removal option available to them, hitting them in the face will get the job done. Bran Farsia now picked Oof. up alongside all these tools. It is going to be the Nether. So essentially, X Hope actually did miss some damage there by trading into the board. But if he had have gone face, we might have seen B7 not be forced to Nether. He could have had a yeah, more play the flexible instead, turn. Yeah. So. I mean, a second Arcanite Reaper is kind of what you're looking for for Exop here to start piling on the damage. Unfortunately, his other card is Fire War Axe. He can't dual wield yet, maybe, in Hearthstone. I don't know if that's going to come at some point in the future. But uh, yeah, the Arcanite Reaper is going to provide a huge amount of damage. But B787 can provide a pretty huge wall as well in the form of the Brand Twilight Drake. And this is going to be nigh impossible, as we can see the Farseer and the Draxus and the Siphon Soul in hand for B7. It looks like on the back of Reno Jackson as, as shock horror, he might win this pirate matchup. Yeah, and I, like, you know, we've had a joke about it, but I don't want to polarize the whole game about that draw. We, you know, we'd have to go back and look at every single turn from X-Hope. Is there a few points of damage that he yeah. missed somewhere along the line? Those early turn sequences where he chose to hold back on the 1-1s, the one for example, was met with the Doomsayer. Probably didn't make too big of a difference, but there may have been an opportunity where X-Hope could have raced faster in the spot that he was in. The turn where I suggested ignoring the Kazakas, for example, did that get, over the, get him over the line if he went back and looked at it. But right now, if you're X Hope, it's important that you just block this game out of your psyche. You still have plenty of opportunities to get the job done. And I think that is, you know, we were talking earlier, leaving Pirate Warrior up, even if you build decks to stop them, is dangerous. Look how close X Hope got. Yeah. And B787's decks are built to deal with this. And, you know, he does take the win. This could be the beginning of a comeback for him. We said it. There is a chance that he can just sweep Pirate Warrior. And that would be pretty crazy, to be honest. Yeah, this is the deck he does want to play against. But, you know, let's set it in context yet again. That was a game where he had Voidwalker on one. He had Doomsayer early on. He had all these potential defensive tools. And he's, he still needed that Reno Jackson draw to stop X-Hope having that guaranteed lethal set up the next turn. So, you know, if that's potentially his best deck in the matchup, even arguable between that and the Reno Mage, probably, then, you know, how much are the rest of them going to struggle if X-Hope puts together a solid draw with the Pirate hey, Warrior? I am loving that hat. You, you guys have been in the audience all day, so thank you for that. And I, I might try and steal that hat later on. <laughs> the single most dedicated fan we have in the yeah. entire audience by far. Shouts to you. Enjoying the Hearthstone Yeah, action. give them a clap, guys. Enjoying the Bahamas, I'm sure. But... X-Hope and B787 are probably feeling the stress and strain of this high-stakes situation to be enjoying the action themselves right now. It is still X-Hope in the comfortable spot, but as we've said, this is where B7's <sighs> lineup B7. can potentially get a spot to shine. Actually praying. I don't know to, to potentially what god, Yogg, maybe. He's uh, praying to <laughs> X-Hope's hat is what he's doing. <laughs> ah, right now, okay. Yeah. This one time. So I'm thinking of how he can bribe it or something. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we are going to get into it. The deck of choice this time for B7 is his Mage. Of course, the Reno list. We have seen this before. Exope, as we've mentioned, Pirate Warrior. It's all he's got left to get a win with. Yes, indeed. And that Fiery War Axe, it used to be just an objective keep in every single matchup, regardless of which Warrior deck you're playing. But there is potential here when you're playing against a very, very greedy control deck to actually throw it away and push harder for one drops. When you say you push harder for one drops, that is not the one drop he's looking for. Patches drawn. This is by far the worst deck to have patches in your hand in. Rogue can get some use out of it. Shaman actually does just fine with it a lot of the time if they get Flame Tongue alongside it. But in Pirate Warrior, it is the absolute worst. It's just a boar? Yeah. Oh, is there anything wrong with boars, by the way? It's just a boar, but you don't even get boar control from it. Exactly. Exactly. But it might have to just come out on turn one at this point. Get is, it, is it even worth skipping? You don't get further benefits. I, I guess. The only thing you can do is play Captain and Patches on four Ooh. and just like, yeah, yeah, plus one damage, in which you would have already made up with, with this play. Yeah. 
Mistress going to come down. The War Axe is going to show its worth here to be able to protect this 1-1 uh, this one -one patches on the board, but Mage can tidy this up quite nicely just with the ping on turn two. No significant damage done just yet from X-Hope as the Pirate Warrior, but starting to curve into some power turns now with the Frothing Berserker, the Naga Corsair, all fantastic tools moving forward. Yeah, and we start to see with B787's hand now is that all, you know, the, all the previous games with this Mage where we're like, oh, you know, the Mage just isn't built to deal with these more mid-range or control decks. Well, look at that now. You know, it's looking pretty reasonable to deal with almost anything Exope uh, brings out. He's pretty much just looking for one rep weapon removal tool, and then it looks like he's got the starter kit to win this match. And Naga Corsair now likely the play for X-Hope. And uh, B7 has a very, very resilient hand, has some removal, has some board freezes. But X-Hope now starting to piece together just straight damage. And this hand from B7, with all the utility that it has, does not play well against straight damage. His only real truly defensive option against that is picking up some armor here from Kazakus. But these minions do need to continue to be dealt with from B7. 5-4 Naga Corsair, such an intimidating threat on the board for someone to be facing down against Pirate Warrior. Yeah, very difficult, and the fireball was just the easy answer there. No need to, if you risk the Kazakus, miss the potion you need, and then you have to fireball anyway, you're potentially taking 10 damage, uh, which is kind of scary in itself. South Sea Captain coming down now with the weapon swing. It means Fire War Axe plus two heroic strikes is a lot of damage that you do not expect from hand, even in Pirate Warrior a lot of the times. Deal 4 has been hit again by B7, so he does have the AoE option. Ooh. No armor gain, no card draw, only resummon and deal 5. But resummon will get him in the Mistress, Correct. which is a heal 4, so that wouldn't be too bad Not at guaranteed all. now that he's played the Babbling Book, though. No B7. I mean, I like Babbling Book as much as the next guy. Yeah, it's actually a serious consideration. He could, If he did not play the Babbling Book this turn, he could have jammed the Kazakas Potion for a guaranteed Mistress heal on the next yeah. turn. And he would have got the Kazakas back as well yep. after the trade. So you get you get a guaranteed plus four heal that kind of has to be dealt with as well. You can use it to trade. And the 3-3, three, three, which lines up against a lot of pirates pretty well. So now X-Hope actually chose to forego playing the Fiery War Axe on the previous turn. There's two considerations that go into that. One, you don't want to activate your opponent's hand if their turn is ooze plus something. You know, you don't have to necessarily give them that target. Secondly, you can just draw a better weapon, a more efficient weapon to play on the next turn and be, you know, chewing up weapon charges by having to overwrite them. So the Arcanite Repo pickup has rewarded that to an extent, but now the question reverses and it's like, do I want to play the Fiery War Axe to test for Acidic Swamp Poos? I know he didn't have it two or three turns ago when I developed this War Axe in the first place. He has had time to draw it since then. Yeah, I do like this play. Because one of the problems as well is you kind of want to defend the captain. Yep. Because it's a very high value card. And it also means later on, Exo can try and play the game of how much damage can I do in a single swing uh, with, with my hero, which is definitely a fun game to play as Pirate Warrior. But something that uh, removes the fun from the Pirate Warrior's side is Reno Jackson. Acidic Swamp Ooze does shut down the weapon. This would, in most worlds, be a huge punish with the Arcanary Reaper coming down, but in terms of huge punishes, X-Hope has just no other way to play this hand. More and more as time has gone on, we're seeing Pirate Warrior being played more like a zoo deck, where they try and develop a board, protect that board, get big buffs out of South Sea Captain, out of Frothing Berserker. But with the hand that X-Hope drew, every single early minion got answered, and then he just drew damage into damage into damage. So he has to commit to face here. He has no choice to do otherwise. The straight up face plan is gonna be locked out of the game on the spot by Mr. Reno Jackson. Yeah, Reno combined with, still look at all the removal tools, all the stall tools that B787 has in hand. He's just gonna, you know, tempo the Twilight Flame Call and just, yeah, just drop a 2-2, feeling pretty confident. The Frostbolt is going to lock out the swing for X-Hope this turn as well. And B787 is now beginning his push to get X-Hope out of this game and continue his life in this tournament. Uh, so he doesn't actually need to load out any damage this turn. He can play Leroy, Heroic Strike, Heroic Strike next turn, which from his perspective represents lethal. And this is actually a big enough number that B7 is at that there might might just be a moment where he feels safe. It would be suicidally greedy to not <laughs> Reno next turn, but some players do just have that greedy streak in their bones. Please no. <laughs> 
A deck you do not be greedy against is Pirate Warrior. 100% Because you get punished every single yeah. time. I've seen it happen, though. I've never seen someone get punished as heavily as this would be right now. But I've seen players in situations where it's like, yeah, I'm 99% sure not to die here. I'm not going to play my Reno. He's going to tempo Antonidas. <laughs> it has get it to on be. the bar. It there we go. Be. OK, okay. Right. B7, 8 7 I was worried for just a split second, just in case. You do drop the Reno. And he's feeling very, very comfortable, no doubt, in this game. Just trying to create some drama in a game <laughs> where he drew Reno. I don't know. What else do you want me to do? I mean, look, I said, how much damage can you do right. with the weapon? It's yeah. a fun game, and sometimes it catches people off guard. But considering the whole point of B787's lineup is to beat this kind of deck, I'm pretty sure he's not going to be greedy because his decks aren't greedy. All right, serious time now. The Reno has come down, and this isn't just for the sake of creating drama. There is still Leroy plus Heroic Strike plus Heroic Strike plus Arcanite Reaper plus South Sea Deckhand. That is 21 damage going in. He can't play it all this turn, but it's 21 out of 30 that he's able to do already. How does he survive the requisite number of turns to be able to pick up those extra nine points of damage he needs to end the game? It's going to be really difficult because I genuinely think if you don't, if you try to survive and trade, say, one minion off, yeah. well, you're going to fall short. That's like probably the, yeah, an yeah. entire extra turn exactly. that you need you, to yeah, draw. You yeah. effectively lose the damage, which right. gains them a turn anyway. So I just think you just go all in. He has the Nizos first mate to proc a weapon for the deckhand as well. So this swing can be free without much um, you know, drawback. So now he can play all of his cards next turn. Uh, you know, We'll see what he draws, of course. See if he can squeeze that in as well. But X-Hope pretty much committed to this one plan now. It's all he's got left. E787 is doing what he can. And yeah, Tempo Antonidas. Yep, love it. Needs to set himself up a clean lethal for the next turn. Can't allow X-Hope any additional turns. That Antonidas does the job just fine. That upgrade still only represents 10 damage in total that gets to go face. And with that Antonidas in play, any spell can activate a free fireball draw for B7. Looks like he has locked up the second game in his epic quest to 4-0 reverse sweep the Pirate Warrior of X-Hope. I mean, if he does it, fair play to the guy. Sure. Can't argue with that. It would be absolutely incredible. X-Hope doing what he can, but he's probably not got much hope for this game. Yeah, and he has to commit. He can't trade here for the exact reasons that you've talked about. It just it, He's going to need entire extra turns if he does that. So he's just saying to the opponent, hey, if you have any spell in your hand that costs I less lose. than six, yeah. I lose. Any source of damage, any cheap spell that can get you a fireball is going to do the job. But this is my majority out. He's just going to rub it in and use there. the ice block. Yeah, I was even not? more safe. <laughs> why not? Oh, oh, you see there, B7, just take a seat. Relax back in the chair. OK, there's two two more against this Pirate Warrior deck from Exo. Uh, he's suddenly perked up. If you can't see what he's doing right now, looking down at his keyboard, he is already in business mode. He's messaging the admins what his next deck is going to be, potentially. We saw him you know, stressed out, big signs of emotion after every game in the past. Now he's in the comfort zone. He's farming Pirate Warriors. <laughs> this is what he loves to do. And now he is on the road to victory. Potentially still a long way to go, though, because this mid-range Shaman doesn't have all the effective tools that potentially um, the Reno decks have, and still huge question marks about the efficacy of that Reno Priest in general. Yeah, and B787 just whacking some eye drops in there, making sure he can see the board clearly. And he can see his health total, because that's what he needs <laughs> to keep his eye on when he's playing against Pirate Warrior. Yeah, and it's, it's just all going to come down to this now. This Pirate Warrior has to find a way. The Pirate Warrior from his side, from X Hope's side, generally does the same things every game. That's what the deck is built to do. It's the sign of a good aggro deck. It's built to be consistent, to do the same thing over and over again. Repetitive damage, building a board, sticking minions, gaining the tempo, pushing aggression early on. These slower, greedier builds from B7 are more inconsistent. But if they are able to line up the right tools, they have everything they need to shut down that linear game plan of the Pirate Warrior. Yeah, and we see B787 doing the exact same motions he did before his last game, and it worked. So I'm not even going to blame him for that one. Seems to be working so far. It's going to be the Shaman as the pick from B787 here, which will leave him with his uh, his Priest. 
the to be Reno able to get the Priest win later. Will be the decider if it gets that far. But let's talk about B7's list here. His Shaman deck has only one Feral Spirit, which is a little bit concerning coming up against Pirate Warrior. Feral Spirit is an enormous card, yeah. not early in the game so much, but as a late game wall when there's an Arcanite Reaper staring you down. That's when Feral Spirit can really pick up enormous amounts of value. He does also have, predictably, double Jinyu Water Speaker in his deck. No copies of Healing Wave or anything crazy like that. The rest of his deck, just pure mid-range Bloodlust Shaman with the Alakir that you see. Only the sprinkling of the Jade package in there, not the full commitment with the Chieftains and the Jade Spirits that we saw from x -Hope. Yeah, and we saw B787 at the start of the game just just praying to the, the gods of Hearthstone to help him out on this one. And x -Hope is just talking to his good friend his hat to see if you can get some luck here because it's not going well already there's a mana worm from the maelstrom portal the maelstrom just clearing up the first turn from the pirate warrior is pretty horrible for x hope here and even the jade claws coming out is a great tool to continue to trade away with minions as well yeah if you missed the game earlier x hope's opening round game and are wondering what this hat is all about we, we thought it was just a nervous tick at first just you know something he does with his hands with his mouth just chewing on his hat a little bit when we got a chance to interview him, it actually turns out there's some kind of special relationship. He feels like he can communicate with the game itself, with the cards in his deck, through the medium of his hat somehow. It's one of the most bizarre stories I've ever heard in Hearthstone. But you can see, not too much of it going on early. Now as the pressure is heating up, that hat is firmly locked next to his mouth. Yeah. He's very, very focused. And I would... These are the situations you're so far ahead in a series and then your opponent starts to come back and then doubt starts creeping into your mind. So I don't blame him for taking any route that makes him feel more comfortable sure. and more confident because that is exactly what you need when you feel like you were so close and now it feels like you might be getting so far away. And just to remind everyone, this is the elimination match. You lose this and you are out. Yep. The winner gets to fight another day and come potentially up in the uh, the lower bracket finals of the group, if you like, and have a chance uh, to join our one qualified player so far, who is Shdown Udachi. But this frothing has had no answer. And guess what? There is another frothing in your future coming right up. If there was no answer to the first one, there's probably no answer to the second. Jade Lightning is a card that comes into play on the next turn that wouldn't have been available there. But still, you're going to have two frothings things consolidated jade lightning would only take care of one yeah a lot of the time if the you know even with one health at this point already seen maelstrom come out early on so the odds are you know very much in x hope's favor that the uh, at least one of the frothings will live and everything else doesn't look quite good enough the captain doesn't get any inherent uh, well, initial benefit other than he wants to go into the corsair next turn and build from there right yeah, it has to be second frothing here, and I, I like holding on to this 1-2 weapon as well because it allows you to get two additional damage next turn out of the Naga Corsair by holding on to both charges, which, you know, Naga Corsair doesn't actually necessarily have to go on to a bigger weapon because it, it essentially does the same effect either way. It doesn't add one durability, it only adds one damage. Yeah. So the size of the weapon you put it on doesn't matter too much. He's actually just going to choose to send it into the Flame Tongue preemptively, though, to get that initial buff on his frothing. You, uh, you called the lightning. I did. Good work. Jay Lightning is going to clear up the smaller frothing. This uh, always feels like a weird decision. It's yeah. like, so I can kill the one on full health or not, as we can see B787 has just changed his mind. So I can kill the one on full health, but that makes the frothing that's on one do at least seven the turn after. There's still the weapon to proc even more damage as well. So it has Ooh. gone for developing some more minions and clearing up the smaller one. Now there's just so many answers. This deckhand is going to get some work done. Yeah, Captain into deckhand there is huge. And B7 there went for the Totem into Flame Tongue play, which reduces more damage over two turns because he gets to kill the bigger frothing first. But it does make his plays less flexible. He now 100% yeah. has to Jade Lightning the other frothing the next turn. So has he limited himself too much by getting greedy there in terms of which frothing he removes? Because now there's just these other huge additions threats on the board. The Fiery War Axe is going to get buffed up to additional durability. There's still the Naga Corsair to represent more damage off this, and there's still a heroic strike to back this up. X is B7's plan going to fall flat just a little bit too short? 
Xhope is just saying go at this point, and because of the way the cards have lined up for B787, he can't really squeeze much in into a turn until the Hex came out. It was either Azure Drake or J Claw's Totem. Both of those plays are not good enough. Even the Hex is not good enough at this point. And B787 looked like there was just a little clap there saying, okay, this is it. After a very, very close couple of games there, B787 could have been on the verge of coming back. X-Hope does finish up this series with the Pirate Warrior. Yeah, a valiant effort in the end for, for B787. Once we, uh, we got the right information that the Pirate Warrior was left up, his strategy started to make more sense, his tech decisions make sense, but my big question to someone that brings a strategy like this is, does the maths add up? Can you beat the best deck in the format, even with the optimal choices, with a high enough consistency to make it a viable strategy? But I think throw all that stuff out the window. I think B7 will have gained a lot of fans at home just because of the mentality of, hey, I'm a control player. These are the decks I play. These are the decks I love. My inspiration was to follow Matson, who was a control warrior player. This is what I'm going to do. Come hell or high water, I'm playing control. Yeah, and we can see the group A bracket and how it is shaping up as we move on through day one. B787 has been knocked out of the tournament and he now, you know, he isn't going home yet. He can hang out with us. He can watch the rest of the matches. <laughs> just so you all know, we don't just ship him home. But uh, X-Hope does move on to face Frozen later on in the tournament. Tournament and Stanu Dashi, obviously the uh, current winner of that group. So everything's starting to shape up as we move further through day one. But we do have X Hope now standing by with Rachel for some weird, uh, words, sorry, on that very close victory. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, X Hope, you had a really tough match against Stanu Dashi before. Now you recovered, came back in a huge fashion here against B787. What did you do to reset yourself after your match earlier today? Uh, you 你之前的话和就是和你之前的对手就是那场比赛其实结果很不理想那么但是在这场比赛当中你表现很好你是怎样去调整你自己或者做了哪些准备嗯其实我因为我觉得在打第一个对手的时候卡组上本身就有劣势